Welcome everybody to BARC's Intro to Forest Policy. Um, this is part of BARC's Radical Series, so we have um, ongoing trainings in the next couple of weeks. If you aren't familiar with them, you can look at the BARC's website, um, and we have recorded trainings on Vimeo in the last couple of weeks too. Um, I'll just get an introduction a little bit about BARC. BARC is a nonprofit organization. Um, our mission is to transform Mount Hood National's forest into a place where natural processes prevail, where wildlife thrives, and where local communities have a social, cultural, and economic investment in its restoration and preservation. Uh, since 90, 1999, BARC has organized people from communities around Mount Hood National Forest to keep watch over the ecological conditions of the forest, um, the actions of the federal agency tas tasked with managing these public lands, the Forest Service. Um, BARC's 21 years of work is thanks to many, many volunteers. Um, some current like volunteer opportunities are ground truthing, proposed timber sales, serving wetlands and beaver habitat, comet writing, and the Free Mount Hood campaign, which is um, part of working to reform Mount Hood National Forest Forest Plan. Um, so if you're interested in working with BARC, you can visit BARC's website uh, at www.barkout.org. Um, for more information, and I'll put that in the chat. You can also email me um, at forestwatchbarkout.org, which I'll also put in the chat. Don't forget the hyphen. Um, so, bark yes, spark-dash, <laughs> yes, spark-dash out.org. Um, so I'm Nisha, I'm Bark's Forest Watch Assistant, and I help to organize field surveys, and I'm gonna be helping to host this uh, tonight. And me and Brenna, do you wanna introduce yourselves? I'm Kayla and I'm a BARC volunteer. A super badass BARC volunteer, I have to admit. Um, and my name's Brenna Bell. I'm going to be the main presenter tonight. I'm BARC's policy coordinator and staff attorney. I've worked on Mount Hood forest issues since about 1997 when I was a young earth firster who blocked roads and sat in trees to stop logging, which led me to get a law degree because I'm afraid of heights and I knew that that wasn't a long-term solution. Um, and I've been working with BARC for about the past 10 years in all sorts of different policy, legal, and organizing aspects. And I love giving this training. Um, I've been doing it for several years and every time it changes and it grows. Um, tonight, we're going to focus on two things, two things that I really wanted to pull out in this particular version of the training. The first is I, I always have gone through kind of a historical, how did this land come to be managed by the, the United States government question. Um, but given the current conditions uh, and movements around racial reckoning, I wanted to take it a step even further and like really look, like, look at what happened in Oregon to transfer this land from native control to US government control. So we're gonna spend a little bit more time on the history than I often have done before. And then we're also going to spend time focused on fire. I always like to pick something that's really topical to look at like how do all these pieces of the history and the policy intersect in a like a tangible current example. And I can't think of anything better than fires as they're the biggest topic in Oregon right now. So that's a little overview we're going to, it's a lot of information. Um, if you like to take notes, I would suggest doing so. That always helps me organize a lot of info. It's gonna be more pictures and talking than word slides. And um, I like questions. It's going to be a little bit legally wonky at some parts, but I try and keep it pretty accessible. If at any time though, you're like, I, I have no idea what you're saying, Brenna, feel free to raise your hand like Zoom style because I can't see everybody or put it in the chat and Misha will alert me to your question. Um, I think that's it for the, the organizing. We'll be together for about an hour and a half. Um, it's a lot of info to tuck in there. I promise to keep it as lively as I can. Um, but before we get into the training as such, I want us to take a minute and focus on Bark's practice of land acknowledgement. And so this is the only big word slide that you're going to have, but I want people to be able to read along with me as I speak this because it's something that we've been working as a community to develop. So we're not just doing rote land acknowledgements because it's the woke white thing to do 
but really getting into what does it mean for us to be people on stolen land. So I'm going to read this and you can read along with me. As an organization founded by white people in the settler colonial lineage, Bark is part of a legacy of land theft and the erasure of native authority over the lands now referred to as the public lands of Mount Hood National Forest. As an organization, we have established influential relationships with the Forest Service, part of the same federal government which facilitated the violent land theft, colonization, and displacement of indigenous people. Non-native barkers have access and privilege to this land because of this violent legacy. We are working to transform our organization to take responsibility for this legacy and these unearned privileges. We are learning to practice acknowledgement, respect, and support for the Malalas, Kalapuyans, Chinook and Clackamas, Chinook and Wascos, Northern Paiute people and Sahaptan speaking peoples who live here and who have always lived here and the many other native nations who have always been part of and cared for the land that we now occupy. And I respectfully invite any native people who might be here today to have a few minutes to speak freely about this legacy. Not hearing anyone, I'd like all of us who are non-native tonight to take a couple of minutes to just write a note to ourselves outlining your intentions to really continue this practice of land acknowledgement to take it more from uh, performative allyship to real allyship. We're gonna take a few minutes and then I'm going to see if there's any folk who want to volunteer what they've written. All right, thanks y'all. Is there anyone who is willing to share what they wrote as an intention to forward this with the rest of the group? And I know this is a little edgy, but, but feel free to lean into that discomfort a bit. Brenna and everyone, I'd like to share. Um, this is Mia and I'm a Bark volunteer. Um, I, I grew up on the East Coast of the US where I never encountered, um, I never encountered land that didn't, uh, that didn't have to account for itself in private real estate terms. Everything was owned by someone that was usually not me. And when I came to the West Coast, um, I encountered for, for the first time the idea of there being public land and, um, you know, the song, this land is your land, this land is my land. And, uh, and I thought, well, wow, that's, that's great. Like, that's a really great idea. And that was with me for a long time. And I'm now learning to, uh, I'm now starting because it will be a lifelong process of reconciling that with the knowledge that the idea that this land can be my land is because of violent land theft. And so there's a lot of undoing of, uh, of ideas and assumptions that I am just starting. Thank you all. Thanks for sharing, Mia. Would anybody else like to share a few things with us? Uh, could I share something? For yes, please. Um, I think it's uh, important to recognize that most, if not all, uh, First um, First Nations peoples didn't even have a concept for the ownership of land mm -hmm. in their culture, um, because who could own land? Um, we all depend on the land for our survival. It's not something that you can own. And um, unfortunately, that position or that that um, mindset is probably contributory to why European colonization was able to take place um, because they couldn't even understand why we would take this concept of ownership and, and, and take this land from them. I, I don't even, I think that was a, uh, a really difficult corner for them to even mentally get their minds around uh, and their hearts around. Um, and it, by the time they realized what was happening was it was too late. Thank you. Does anybody else have an intention to share with us? I do. My, my name is Nicholas. And I'll just go ahead and read. I probably didn't write this all. Anyway, I'll do my best here. I intend to acknowledge that these public lands were taken from indigenous people and that it is important to recognize that they were on this land prior and deserve respect and also acknowledgement for the injustices 
that took place and continue to take place. If possible, if there's any way to rectify any of these um, injustices, injustices towards indigenous people, that would be, um, would be great. And that's what I have. Thank you so much for sharing, Nicholas. And thank you all for doing this practice with us as we're really working to unsettle ourselves both individually and collectively as an organization. And um, that really leads great into the beginning of this training. We're gonna talk just a little bit about what was going on in what we now call Oregon before white settlement. Because the question is, how did these lands become part of the US federal government? And, you know, like Mia, like many of us, we go through this, I, I have gone through this process of moving from a place where I proudly say, these are our public lands. This is the birthright of all Americans to have access to Mount Hood National Forest, to thinking like, really, is it? Who were these first? And this is um, one map of the, you know, super diverse tribal presence in this land beforehand. There were approximately 60 tribes that lived in Oregon's diverse environmental regions. At least 18 different languages were spoken across hundreds of villages. And you can see the Chinook, the Kalapuya, the Wasco, Wishram, Clackamas tribes, all lived in that area that we now call Mount Hood National Forest. So we're gonna launch into history first and then move that into politics and policy. How did it get to be owned by the federal government? So in Oregon country, before any treaties had been signed, before any tribes had surrendered any of their lands, the government began to give the land away. Beginning in the 1840s, the US government wanted to support Western expansion spurred by migration into Oregon territory. And to encourage that settlement, the settlement of bona fide white settlers, as they would say, the US Congress passed what was called the Distribution Preemption Act of 1841. And that recognized the squatters' rights and allowed settlers to claim 160 acres of land in the new territory. Now remember, at this point in time, the US government basically had no claim over this land. And the tribes had not ceded any of this land. Not only that, but at that time, the Oregon Territory was jointly managed by the United States and Great Britain. So the Congress in DC was beginning their process of manifest destiny by saying, if you squat the land, we will legitimize you with the power of the US government and give you title to the land that we actually have no legal right to do. So they started doing that. They said after residing on the property for 14 months, a claimant could purchase that property at $1.25 an acre. So in 1843, the non-native settlers in the Willamette Valley drafted up their own constitution and established their own provisional government. Again, this is pre-US even having claim to this land and pre-statehood, they started to create their own government to give their settlement legitimacy. Under their new government, the settlers could claim up to 640 acres of land at no charge, although no treaties had still been signed by any of the tribes. So this is, this is some of the research that I just got into because I, I usually started in 1850 with the Donation Land Claims Act, but I've learned in prepping for today that it, it's before 1850, before Oregon Territory was declared a US territory. So, but the growth of the settler colonialist population was so great and steady that it helped bring about that treaty between Great Britain and the US in 1846, which established the borderline at the 49th parallel, where it currently is, like at the top of Washington state. So that gave the US claim to everything south of the 49th parallel. The Oregon Territory was officially formed in 1848. But in that territorial creation, by kind of an act of political um, magic, all the land grants that had been recognized under the provisional government were nullified. So they, were, they disappeared. So people had their land, right, that they had stolen with no rights from the 
and the provisional government was like, yay. Then they got the territorial government. They're like, eh, we can't recognize those. And so Oregon's first, Oregon has this legacy of like hyper racist anti-Indian legislators and senators. And our very first one, the first Oregonian territorial representative, a guy named Samuel Thurston was like, well, this doesn't work we have to get legitimacy for these land claims that these settlers already have. So he went to DC and as one of his first legislative efforts, he created the Oregon Donation Land Claims Act of 1850. And the main thing, there did three main things. The first was it recognized past claims that had been decided under the provisional government. So it basically retroactively applied to the land grab that had already happened. It created a new office of surveyor general of the public lands, someone who could survey and disperse future land claims, and it made land grants to new settlers. So if you remember from that provisional government, they uh, granted land up to 640 acres to settlers, well, that's what the Oregon Donation Land Claims Act focused on because that was the number that was already there. So the act granted 320 acres free of charge to every white unmarried male. And if you were male and married, then you could get an additional 320 acres. So a white married couple could get 640 acres of land free of charge and if you were a white male, it was 320 acres. Now you might be saying, but didn't people live here? Like what's going on with the tribes? What was going on with the treaty process? In doing some research, I started really reading about the legacy of the treaty making process in Oregon. And it is seriously messed up to, and to, I can't do it justice telling the story. I'll say very briefly, there was one agent of the federal government who went around making treaties with native tribes that allowed them to stay on their land, albeit much smaller, but on their land. And he went back to Congress and was like, let's do this. And Congress refused to ratify any of those treaties because the white settlers were like, we don't want to live near Indian people. And so all of those treaties that the native people thought they entered got nullified. They didn't ever get entered. And then there was a second round of treaties that were accompanied by military presence that basically threatened them, if you don't relocate, we will destroy you. So that was the second round of treaty negotiations, the one we tend to hear about that Joel Palmer did. So what ended up happening to make the Don Oregon Donation Land Claims Act valid is the US Congress passed a law that terminated the native title to all the land to quote, leave the whole of the most desirable portion open to white settlers, went in with military presence, forced a second round of treaty negotiations. I say negotiations um, lightly. It was more like uh, do this or we'll kill you and relocated almost all the tribes from the most desirable parts for settlement, like the tribes from the Willamette Valley, the Rogue Valley, the Umpqua Valley, all got pushed out either to the coast or east of the Cascades. And that, those areas like Grand Ronde and Warm Springs, where a lot of the tribes had to go and create the confederated tribes, were chosen specifically because of their undesirable ability for white settlement. The main reason they got the land is because no white settlers wanted to live there. And I just wanna do a final note about that Oregon Donation Land Claims Act is members of native tribes were not considered US citizens and therefore they could not own land under the Donation Land Claims Act. However, it did allow, quote, American half-breed Indians of legal age to take donation land claims. They were the only non-bona fide white settlers who were able to take donation land claims. However, as you know, John noted, private land ownership was not a big part of native culture. So the idea that one individual would have 320 or 640 acres was more about assimilation than about actually being a way to redistribute land equitably. 
So during that whole process, the US government grabbed all that land for itself and began the process of redistributing the land to its bona fide white settlers. In five years time, 7,437 land patents were issued by the General Land Office giving settlers claim to 2.8 million acres of the most desirable land in Oregon. Some of the settlers who got those donation land claims were my great, 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 great grandparents who displaced Malala people in what is now Springfield. A lot of us in Oregon have that legacy. We got the land for free and started a legacy of land holding that was only allowed to people of European descent. And one of the things we've been talking about right now culturally around racial reckoning is who gets access to land and why. And that is a fundamental piece of it in Oregon is there was a free land for white people and it was everyone else was excluded from getting it. So that's a history that we need to sit with and it bleeds right into what happened next with how that land that was given to, you know, the, the most desirable land was given to the settlers, but what happened to the rest of the land? The land that settlement didn't occur on, that less desirable pieces. So we're gonna talk about what happened to the land that the general land office was holding after this great just orgy of land distribution to white settlers. Actually, before I do that, I want to let that settle in and see if there's any like questions or thoughts because that's a lot of genocidal history to take in at once. I had a question. Yeah. My question is, has there been any attempt or talk about having some kind of reparations for what's occurred? I would hope that there has been or that there's a dialogue started or something, you know. <laughs> yes and yes, but it hasn't gained much traction yet. Okay. Um, slightly outside of Bark's purview, the uh, Fremont Wainema National Forest in kind of south central Oregon was created completely from the Klamath tribes reservation when their tribe got terminated in the 18, in the 1950s in a whole next step of bad legislation by Oregon senators and they really want their land back. They want their reservation back and it's a national forest and that's been a, a move for years and years and has um, kind of moved in starts and stops. But that is one place where I think it would be fantastic and very clear that a tribe had claimed to land, lost it because of political finagling and should get it back. That dialogue hasn't really happened yet on Mount Hood National Forest. Um, it's something that I, if, if the Warm Springs tribe or Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs was interested in engaging, I think Bark would really want to support, but they haven't brought it up yet. Are there any other questions? Erica, yeah, Erica in the chat asked, you mentioned those with partial Native heritage could get donation claims. Mm -hmm. um, did this include women? You know, that's a good question. I bet it included married women. <laughs> you, you had to be married. As a woman, you could not get your own land claim. But if you were married, you get an additional 320 acres to go along with your husband's claim. But I can't say for sure. A quick question too. Um, kind of wondering uh, what was considered, or I guess where was considered uh, desirable or undesirable land. I'm assuming it has to do with, I don't know, farming or accessibility or beauty, stuff like that. But if you know specifically general areas, Absolutely. It was very much the valleys. I mean, the Willamette Valley was seen as the gem. I, I was, if y'all are into Oregon history, the Oregon Historical Society has a thing online called the Oregon Encyclopedia, which is amazing. And you can spend way too much time reading about Oregon history. And so I was doing a little bit about that today. And it was talking about how the Willamette Valley was the primary draw for settlers, especially people from the Midwest who are coming with a lot of agricultural experience. Um, and then the Rogue Valley and the Umpqua Valley, basically the valleys all up and down between the Coast Range and the Cascades because they were more flat, more arable land. There were also land claims that were done more in the foothills. Those were more for um, shepherding. There were a lot of sheep in Oregon at that time and some mining claims. But the, the dominant 
focus of settlers claims was in the valley lands. That's why I, I'll, I'll move into the next piece. That's why we ended up in the position that we did historically where the federal government who had declared title to all of this land and then only given away part of it was left holding the mountains. It was basically left with a cascade range and it didn't really know what to do with it. And so that, that was a big shift beginning in the late 19th century. Federal public land policy began to shift from disposal, where they were just giving it away for settlement, to retention of lands and federal ownership for conservation. And we also, we have a few more questions in the chat on the last oh, subject. Oh, do we? Yeah. Why don't we get yeah. to those? We'll do those first. Three Sorry. more questions. Yeah, <laughs> um, lots of questions. Uh, when was, so when was the Land Claims Act put into place, like year timeline? It was in um, 1850 was the Donation Land Claims Act and it was both retroactive for claims that had been done in the past five years and then it was future facing, I believe, for the next five years. So kind of anyone who had staked mm -hmm. that claim between 1845 and 1855. Um, then Matthew asks, do you have recommendations on where we can go for research on public policy during this time of Oregon settlement, preferably peer? Yeah, the, um, the Oregon Encyclopedia is fantastic. And also the grant, the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde have a really good um, website with a lot of this history and Warm Springs also. And OPB did a fantastic thing that I was going to put in the chat, but it seems like since I'm sharing my screen, I can't. Um, OPB did a wonderful article about broken treaties. And it's an oral history project around all the treaties and what happened with them. And I would deeply suggest people listen to that. I'm sure you can find it just going to OPB and broken. Oh, hey, I just found the chat. Ah! Just a sec, I'll put it in. Those were the two resources I wanted to give to everyone. Um, the Oregon Encyclopedia and that OPB article are both really good for more history on this time. Anything and then John, um, John commented on, um, during, so during the events Bernard just described, European-born diseases were decimating Pacific Northwest tribes, such as smallpox and measles. Um, during the mid 1850s. Absolutely, that's um, one of the main reasons they, that, that the tribes couldn't really fight back when they received so much military force because up to 80% of their population had died since you know, the introduction of those diseases in the early 1800s. And they, were, you know, they did not have time to spring back as a society before settler colonization came. It was a really rough time for the Oregon tribes. We think 2020 is bad. <laughs> I, I, I live with five indigenous people who have given me an earful about using the term apocalypse. They're like, seriously, they're like, fuck that. We've been through the apocalypse. Don't talk to us about apocalypse. Our ancestors, we are living in our ancestors' apocalyptic nightmare. And I was like, oh, yes, you are. It really actually got me thinking a lot about when we use that term as the beneficiaries of settler colonization, what that means. Because this is the native tribes apocalyptic nightmare where their people are dispersed, their languages are extinct, um, and they're just still scraping by to hold any kind of cultural continuity. All right. <laughs> On that, shall we, shall we move on to a bunch of white guys who are into conservation? Because, because that is the genetic DNA of Bark. Um, that is part of our, these guys here are part of our legacy. Um, so that was the next thing that happened, right? So the federal government had all this land and they're like, what do we do with all this land? And there were a lot of, um, there was a growing conservation effort. It was almost exclusively white men in the late 1880s, 1890s, they were recreationalists, they were hikers. I mean, you know these guys, right? They're the John Muirs, the, um, the Audubons, the people who got out there and experienced the West. And uh, in this picture, the guy on the far, far screen, the skinny guy in white, his name was Will Steele. 
And I put Will in this picture because he was responsible for the first set aside in Oregon of land, taking it out of government's, um, uh, out of the GLO's hands, the general land office's hands for disposal and putting it aside for conservation for scenic and recreation purposes. Can anyone tell me where this is? The, the first set aside in Oregon? Crater Lake. That's Mount right. It's, it's Crater Lake, it's Mount Mazama. So Will Steele was also the founder of the Mazama Club. Um, he, for, he, got the, he got it taken out of the, the GLO's hand so it wouldn't be settled on. And then he fought for 17 years for it to become a national park. And eventually in 1905, Crater Lake became a national park. It was the fifth national park in the United States, still the only national park in Oregon. Um, so that was this beginning tide of uh, awareness that the land could be held for something besides just redistributing it to settlers. And that's the, the beginning. This is like the DNA of both the conservation movement as we know it and also the US Forest Service. So what started happening um, in the 1890s, there was a legislation signed in 1891 that allowed the president to establish forest reserves, take, take that land away from the general land office and hold it as reserves. And um, the first use of that law in Oregon was brilliant. It was by the city of Portland in 1890. And what do you think the first piece of land that the city of Portland asked to be reserved from settlement was? It was a really good Forest idea. Park. What was that? Maybe Forest Park. No, because Forest Park's not federal land, right? That's That was a really good move on the city. Bull but, Run. Bull Run, that's it. It was a fellow, you know that street called Failing in Portland? And you're like, why would they name a street Failing? Well, it's named after Henry Failing. He was the chair of the Portland Water Commission in the 1890s. And he asked that a forest reserve be created around the new municipal watershed at Bull Run. So the forest, the Bull Run Forest Reserve was almost 150,000 acres. And that was established by presidential proclamation in 1892. That was the beginning seed of what was to become Mount Hood National Forest. And then they way expanded that and in 1893, they created the Cascade Range Forest Reserve, which was four and a half million acres and 235 miles long. It basically was the backbone of the whole Cascade Range in Oregon. And that was initially seen as, as a conservation effort. It was thought to be reserved for conservation, recreation, and scenic beauty. But with this conservation came pushback and petitions to dismantle that reserve. In the 1895 and 1896, those protests didn't actually come from timber interests. Right now, we mostly like go head to head with timber interests but the timber industry had not yet boomed in Oregon. And as I said before, it was mostly sheep herders and miners that were active in the Cascades and pushed back against it. And the entire reserve system almost crumbled, but for a group of conservationists who traveled to Washington DC in 1896 and convinced the Oregon delegation to keep those reserves intact. So we now have this huge Cascade Forest Reserves. It's the late 1890s. We're into conservation, but things are about to shift again thanks to another bad senator from Oregon. We have such a history. So Congress finally transferred all of that land from the General Land Office to the newly created Forest Service in 1905. But there was an Oregon senator who wanted to make it very clear that these lands were not reserved for recreation or scenic, but they were working forests to be used for timber. So Senator Charles Fulton is responsible for changing the name from forest reserves to national forests. And after 1905, we ended up with kind of what we 
know today as the Forest Service. These are the federal lands in Oregon now. So after all of that happens, this is what the federal government was left holding after all of the land distribution. You can see the red here are the reservations. The largest one is Warm Springs. There's a small, tiny little Grand Ronde that used to be a lot bigger, but it's gotten shrunk. The green is National Forest, and the yellow is Bureau of Land Management Land. All right, now we're going to get into the Forest Service, and we're, we're starting to get into the how we got how we got where we are now um, in terms of the Forest Service itself. So. The new Forest Service, right, were in 1905. They created this thing called the Use Book. Um, it laid out the policy and the regulations for forest reserves. And it said, quote, forest reserves are for the purpose of preserving a perpetual supply of timber for home industries, preventing destruction of the forest cover, which regulates the flow of streams, and protecting local residents from unfair competition in the use of forest and range. And then it goes on to say, in the management of each reserve, local questions will be decided upon local grounds, which still is happening in the forests. They're very, very decentralized on their local forests. The dominant industry, quote, timber, will always be considered first, but with as little restriction to minor industries as may be possible. Sudden changes in industrial conditions will be avoided and where conflicting interests must be reconciled, the question will always be decided from the standpoint of the greatest good to the greatest number in the long run. And out of all of that, it's that last phrase that I really like. And that's what gives me hope because the Forest Service is, you know, the kind of its, its um, birthright is to provide timber the dominant industry, but they have this gem at the end that says the greatest good to the greatest number will help resolve conflicts of interest. And sometimes it feels like we're doing almost impossible work in trying to reform an agency that from its birth has been focused on protecting timber interests. But there's also that piece where it recognizes the public good as being part of what it's doing. But I will say, that said, that my hopeful bit aside, I will say that the greatest good is driven by the primary values of, quote, providing wood to home builders, stream flow for irrigation, range for the livestock industry, and stopping vast public and private losses through unnecessary forest fires. So that is what they defined as the greatest good in 1905. Uh, we would pause it, and I will get here a little bit later, that, that those values need some updating based on current conditions, especially climate change. But that's what they were focused on from the beginning. And now I just want to say a few words about fire suppression before we get in, like we're going to zoom out and talk about the legal structure that followed this historical creation. So. Fire, it's up right now. Um, I'm looking out my window. I can actually see, you know, far out my window now. There are days, a few days ago, where I could only see about 30 feet outside of it. Like we're all living in a lot of smoke. Um, I have a lot of friends in Southern Oregon where I used to live who are in trauma and grief right now because their towns are gone. There's friends up in the Mackenzie and the Santee M who have lost towns and lost houses. Like, we often talk about fire from a more abstract ecological focus, talking about forests. But right now in Oregon, it's really visceral. Um, and I don't, wanna, I don't wanna miss that in this. I am going to be talking mostly about forest ecology, but I know there's a lot of pain in the state right now. And a lot of people are hurting and it's going to be really hard to know how to rebuild where to rebuild um, and have the resources to do it. So I want to acknowledge the gravity of that before moving in and, and talking about more of the backcountry forest fire policy that BARC has been focused on. All right, but that's where I'm going to go. 
<laughs> talking about uh, 120 years of fire suppression. So as many of us know, the forests of this area um, co-evolved with indigenous fire use. The native people in Oregon used fire as their primary land management tool and regularly burned areas to help their horticultural practices cultivate both food and materials for building and weaving. Um, when settler colonists came and foresters, they had very little understanding of indigenous fire and it actually became illegal to light fires in this area. Uh, in Northern California, there were several native people who were executed for uh, lighting fires and their indigenous practices. It was a way of crushing indigenous culture and also led to a vastly changed landscape. Um, when indigenous, that kind of was a double whammy, indigenous fires were put out and then the Forest Service itself adopted a policy of full fire suppression. So we went from a landscape that experienced a lot of fire, uh, different types of fire at different times of year, to a landscape of the past hundred years that has experienced very little fire relative to its historical counterpart. So early Forest Service leaders simply argued that any and all fire in the woods was bad because it destroyed the value of the timber. Added to that were a whole lot of people moving from east to west that really didn't have experiences in very, these really fire prone ecosystems. And, and it was scary to them, kind of like right now. There, were, there was the, what called, called the Great Fire in 1910. It burned three million acres of Idaho and Montana. It killed 86 people and terrified the settlers. Um, so beginning in the 1920s, the Forest Service responded hard in its full suppression approach. It had two main goals. One was preventing fires from starting, thank you, Smokey. And two, if a fire began, suppressing it as quickly as possible. This was further entrenched after World War II like they, they were doing this for a while, not entirely successfully, but it was really their policy. But after World War II, two main things happened. One is there was a huge boom in building and housing. So there was a need for lumber. And two, there were a lot of military vets and a lot of military equipment that didn't have any place to go. So that's when we saw this huge militarization of our firefighting force. That's when things like these airdrops that we see now started and fighting fire like in military formation, which is still the approach started, was after World War II. So educating the public about the need for fire prevention became an important part of that goal. Smokey the Bear debuted in 1944. His propaganda campaign has been incredibly successful. I mean, just, he is such an American icon and it entrenched this fire, this culture of fire exclusion in the public's mind right? Smokey the Bear says, only you can prevent forest fires. To which my fire ecologist friends suggest we change that and say, only you can stop tornadoes. Only you can prevent hurricanes, right? We don't say that because we know that hurricanes and tornadoes are these natural weather driven events that we can't do anything about. As people in Oregon are learning, so are large fires, right? The fires we just had are weather events. There is no, there's no stopping those. There's really not even any prevention. It's, you know, we could not have some of the man-made ignitions that did help, but if there's natural ignitions, those fires are gonna go. And so Smokey got us to think that we could control fire, which has become deeply entrenched in the American psyche. The Forest Service kind of complemented that with their second goal of full suppression. They had what was called the 10 a.m. policy where they decreed that every fire should be suppressed by 10 a.m. the following day. Was like, no fire anywhere was the goal. And you know, the Forest Service revoked the 10 a.m. policy 40 years ago, but most agency fire forest plans, which we'll get into a little bit later, still have that entrenched in them. And that is still the agency policy a uh, default is full suppression right away. So 
all that is a uh, it is the, gosh, I'm like halfway down, more than halfway down, and I'm just giving you the history. Um, but I think it's really important to understand where these things come from. And by understanding where they come from, I think we better understand how we, as the, you know, as the beneficiaries of this system, know how to engage it and how to move forward. So I'll pause there and see if there's any questions on the history before we get into what this looks like in terms of law and policy currently. I think it's worth saying briefly that old growth forests um, are fire resilient and um, that most of the forest fires, not all of them, but most of the fire frequency were small ground fires that did not get up into the canopies of the forest because the forests were historically before European fire suppression, park-like stands, uh, sparsely, not sparsely scattered, but more sparsely scattered and the more, the older trees, there were not a lot of younger trees stair-stepping up into the canopies to carry those fires up into the canopies like there are now uh, after uh, the fire suppression. And the, uh, the, um, the juvenile tree, the trees that are allowed to grow and the, and the fuels that are allowed to build, build up now so that when a fire does hit, it does become this catastrophic event. Um, so that's, and that the bark of some of these old growth trees were very thick like ponderosa pine and Douglas fir and could resist the, the ground fires and not be, not be harmed by them. Thanks, John. I would, I would actually love to like divert into a full-fledged discussion of fire ecology, which is one of my passions. But that, that said, and that's true, mostly, um, I will say there's a lot of, there's a lot of ecological variation around fires, but we have to stick to policy tonight. We're, we're definitely gonna talk about fire ecology more. Um, I'll promote Barks Ecology Clubs. We do a lot of discussion. Our next one in, in October, I think is going to focus on fire and we're going to get more into fire ecology and um, I think how wetlands interact with fire ecology. So- yes, we, beavers and wetlands. Beavers and wetlands and fire. So. If you're interested in the way fire has shaped and works with the landscape, we're definitely going to get more into that in the future. Other questions or thoughts about the history before we move on to the law and policy section? Brenna, I just want to say Courtney K um, put a request in the chat for um, the map, uh, the map of indigenous peoples. Um, uh, before colonialism, and <laughs> this is going to be shared. Uh, this recording is going to be shared, right? Do you have, um, if it's easy at some point for you to put that map into the into the chat? That would be cool. Mm, it might not be easy because I'd have to find it, and that's hard <laughs> to do while I'm talking. Yeah. However, I will say this: I probably got it by just doing a Google image search of Oregon indigenous tribes or like right. Oregon native tribes. So right. I would advocate that people do that for yourself. You'll probably pull up the same map and, and there's actually lots of them that show the tribal distribution in Oregon. Great, thanks. Yeah. Okay, now we get into, you know, not as much of the juicy history. We're going to go right into PolySci 101 review and talk about the three branches of government because you know, the focus of this training is to think about what are all the influences on federal forest management today, right? And so we, we spent a lot of time on the history, but that all also ties into the different branches of government and how they interact with forest policy. So the three branches, quick review, we've got the legislative branch that makes the laws, the direct land management. The executive branch, which is actually un unfortunately right now, very, very much a key player in land management because the executive houses the Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, and all the other relevant agencies um, who implement the laws, right? It's been very difficult in the Trump administration to deal, to deal with that. The president also appoints the department and agency heads and judges. 
So that is a, a you know very the the executive branch has its hands all over federal land management, and then there's the judicial branch, which decides conflicts uh, over whether the laws are being implemented legally. And in Oregon, we have one U.S. District Court, the District of Oregon, and then we're in the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, which contains. I believe the 11 Western states. Um, so all three of those branches have their hands somewhere in public land management. And, you know, BARC is a, a local Portland group, but since we primarily work on federal land issues, we're mostly working with the US government, not the state or local governments. Um, that line is getting a little bit more fuzzy right now as the state and the feds are doing more overlap in terms of like their good neighbor, there's this new thing called good neighbor authority where the state can help on federal lands and the federal government is affecting state lands. And so we're having to track Oregon Department of Forestry more than we did in the past, which is unfortunately not great because they suck. Um, but for the purposes of this, we're just gonna be focused on federal lands. So that is, you know, the, the very basic triangle of government and where people fit. Are there any questions about that and how those all interact with federal lands before I move on? Can I just pipe up? I, I think most people probably know this, but the Forest Service is Department of Agriculture. Right. Yeah, and, and which is odd. Um, most of the other land management organizations or agencies are part of the Department of Interior. Um, but the Forest Service, maybe because trees are crops, is part of the Department of Ag. And it's, a, it's an uncomfortable position. It means like things that happen in the Farm Bill affect the Forest Service. Um, and the Agriculture Secretary is the head of the Forest Service, which right now is Sonny Perdue, who's like a peanut farmer from Georgia. So luckily he doesn't care that much about forests, but he doesn't know anything about forests. Um, Brenna, Brenna, a question also came up yeah. in the chat asking you to uh, maybe elaborate on your characterization of ODF. <laughs> Sorry. Um, I will say that as much as the Forest Service is a timber forward agency, ODF is 10 times that. Um, and in, in part, that's because the Forest Service has at least has things in its like constitutive DNA that are around multiple use and focused on water and recreation and habitat as well as timber ingests. Whereas ODF has been a timber forward organization almost or agency almost its entire existence. And the other really difficult part is that um, there are very few opportunities for the public to engage in ODF decisions. And so for an activist organization uh, like BARC, it can, you know, we, we're used to things, and I'll, I'm about to get into some of the ways that we can engage and influence federal decision making. Most of those avenues are not available when we're talking about ODF. So they are, they also lag far behind um, Oregon, Washington, and Idaho in terms of uh, progressive forest policy that protects water, wildlife, and the communities around them. Um, I was kind of okay with being behind Washington and Oregon, but when I learned that Idaho had better forestry, like I was offended. I was like, come on ODF, you can do better. So there's a lot of people in the state who are right now trying to get ODF to reform, but it's incredibly difficult. Um, so sorry for my shorthand. A, oh yeah, there's a few more questions in the chat. Um, Maria asks, where can I find reviews of current state government and their efforts towards environmental preservation? The, I'd say the best or environmental group working right now on Oregon state issues is Oregon Wild. And they have a really comprehensive information on their website about ODF and what they they have a forest Oregon forest waters campaign that is working to change forest policy on state and private lands and i would look at their uh, forest waters campaign um and how do federally federally recognized tribal sovereign nations interact with this government structure 
they act equal to the Fed? And or I think the question is, do they act equal to the Fed and have their own legislative cha channels? Oh, that is a fantastic question. It's slightly out of the scope of this um, workshop. I will say that they are sovereign nations who need to be consulted on any action that may affect them. And I'll, I'll focus my answer on Mount Hood National Forest because I think it's broader than I can really do justice to. Um, uh, uh, like it's a whole topic, but I'll say on Mount Hood National Forest, before they do any action that could impact our next door neighbors, which is the Confederated Tribes of Warm Springs, you know, the forest shares a huge border, two huge borders with Warm Springs. It's bordered on its southeast side and, um, or actually kind of just south side and east side by Warm Springs. The Forest Service must consult with them on a government to government uh relationship about them that doesn't mean that warm springs can veto any projects it just means that they must be engaged and listened to in those projects they don't have power to stop things but unlike any other member of the public the forest service is required to solicit their engagement All right, y'all with me? Should we keep going? Okay, we're gonna talk just a little bit about another mover and shaker of um, forest policy, which is the economy. And for a lot of its history, especially since the 1900s, early 1900s, Oregon has been considered a timber state. And that has been changing um, in a large part because you can only log old growth once and then it's gone. Those huge trees are not there to log anymore. And so this graph doesn't go deep into the 1970s and 80s in the huge timber boom in Oregon. It starts in 1990, but I, I think it's really, really interesting because if you look at it, it shows you the you know, wood product manufacturing jobs are that green bar. And then that harvest is that little wiggly bar. And what you can see if you look at the 2000, 2008, when we had the Great Recession, the harvest and the jobs both dropped, right? They dropped together. But what happened after 2008? I think is really telling and it's really telling for the future of the wood products industry in Oregon is the harvest rate went up and the job rate basically stayed steady because what happened then is all the mills that made it through that were mechanized and the jobs that were lost aren't coming back and so what we hear a lot is we need to increase logging so we can increase jobs in rural communities. That's a very um, saleable uh, talking point for Oregon politicians. But as this graph shows, you can increase volume a lot without increasing jobs because now the jobs are mostly done by machines. Where they used to be, when I started forest activism, what cut trees down were guys with chainsaws, and now they're feller bunchers, and a feller buncher can do the work of six people, you know? And it, the forest products industry went from being about 40% of Oregon's economy, our GDP, now it's less than 2% of our GDP. So things have really changed in terms of the economy, but the mythos, the, the way we talk about it, the importance it has to Portland's political identity has not caught up with that. Um, but it's important to remember that right now, manufacturing is what is losing jobs, not less harvest. The timber industry does not want us to have that talking point because they're the ones who made the decision to get rid of their employees and replace them with machines but it's very convenient on them to blame environmentalists and say, it's the spotted owl, it's the environmental lawsuits, it's all these things, they're eating up the jobs. 
But really, what we've seen in the trends is mechanization is leading to that. And we'll, we'll, the trends will just continue to be more and more machines and fewer and fewer people employed in the forest products industry in Oregon. So now I want to talk a little bit about laws. Um, I'm a lawyer. This is, this is a fun part for me. I know it's not fun for everybody, but it's important to understand the suite of laws. And I'll end on one that's actually pretty cool and gives us, and I'll tell a good story. So if you can bear with me and sit looking at these clear cuts for a while, we're going to end up with a, with a good, happy story at the end. So over all of this land, is a blanket of laws, of federal laws. And some apply to all federal lands, things like the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, which I'll talk about at the end. Those just blanket all land. It doesn't matter if it's Forest Service or BLM or Fish and Wildlife Service, you have to follow the Clean Water Act and the Endangered Species Act. Some laws, depend on what type of land it is, what designation. Laws like the Oregon and California Lands Act, which uh, I also urge you if you're into interesting Oregon history to research that one. Oregon and California Lands Act, it mostly applies to Southwest Oregon, so I won't focus on it, but it's an awesome story. The National Forest Management Act, which governs how national forests are used. The Federal Lands Management Policy Act, which manages how Bureau of Land Management acts are used, or lands are used. The Wild and Scenic Rivers Act only applies to Wild and Scenic Rivers. The Wilderness Act only applies to wilderness. So some of the laws are dependent on what type of land you have, and some of the laws just blanket it. Um, so within that, there are two main types of laws that we engage. One is substantive. It says you can do this or you can't do this in certain places. And the ones we deal with, the one we deal with the most is the National Forest Management Act, or because we love uh, acronyms, NIFMA. Um, NIFMA is basically came because of land management like this in the 1970s, people were pretty horrified with the way national forests were managed. And they said, we have got to manage them to make it clear that national forests should be managed for multiple use and sustained yield. And so they created this law in the 70s when almost all of these laws were passed in the early mid 70s because of the result of such a strong environmental movement coming out of Earth Day in 1970 and um, really just sweeping this whole suite of environmental legislation in. So what NIFMA said is every national forest has to have a plan. And every plan has to do a few things. It has to designate the highest and best use of the land in the national forest, and it has to create standards and guidelines for managing that land. So it created all sorts of land designations. In Mount Hood National Forest, our forest plan was adopted in 1990. So it's 30 years old. Um, and it sets out 23 different types of land allocations. From wilderness, which is the most protected, to timber emphasis, which is, as you can tell, the most <laughs> emphasis on timber. So there's 23 types of land designations, and then it sets out standards and guidelines so the Forest Service knows on any set piece of land what it's supposed to do and it's not supposed to do. And what NIFMA said is every forest has to have one of those. And then um, on top of that, right, I'm not going to get into the history of the Northwest Forest Plan tonight because Courtney and I are doing a ecology club about the Northwest Forest Plan next Wednesday. So if you want to look at my little face on Zoom again, talking to you about forest policy, um, we're going to get into the history of the Northwest Forest Plan and the last 25 years of the Northwest Forest Plan next Wednesday at ecology club. 
So just know right now, it's enough to know that it exists. In 1994, there were, you know, the timber wars, Bill Clinton came and he's like, I'm gonna solve everything and created this Northwest Forest Plan that amended all the existing forest plans with kind of a regional overlay of management to try and bring more conservation biology to bear in the forest system. So if you really want to start getting into this work, you will probably at some point end up reading the Mount Hood Forest Plan, which is 30 years old, which is the focus of one of Bark's big campaigns to amend and update that forest plan because 30 years ago they weren't talking about um, climate change. 30 years ago their approach to wildfire was full suppression. There's a lot in there that needs to be updated so that it's relevant for today's issues. So that's one set of laws. We've got the substantive laws, you can do this, you can't do this set of laws. And we've got the second set of laws which is the procedural laws. The we don't really care what you do laws but whatever you do, you have to do it a certain way. So with the Endangered Species Act, it's kind of both. It's substantive, like you have to protect species, and it's procedural, you have to consult with uh, other federal agencies. Or for BARC's purposes, our favorite and uh, my best buddy in the law is NEPA, the National Environmental Policy Act. And NEPA would let you pave the globe it doesn't care really whether or not you're doing something um, that's environmentally destructive. What it cares is, did you look at all the environmental impacts of it? Did you disclose these impacts did you, to the public? And did you allow the public to comment on them and consider the public's comments? That's what NEPA says. NEPA is our way in to engaging the Forest Service on its projects. It's the tool that BARC uses probably most in all the tool box. Um, and, uh, and it can be pretty fun to, to work with because if the Forest Service doesn't do a good job, we're there to say, hey, what about these environmental impacts you didn't look at? What about, you know, this is what BARC's work is really focused on getting out on the ground and saying, we found this stream here. You don't have this stream on your map. What are the impacts to the stream? NEPA says you have to tell me. And um, if they do a bad job, we get to spank them. Oops, I'm gonna skip that one. Oh gosh, I had a pretty picture for you to look at during that and I forgot to show it to you. Here, this is to make up for that haircut. Nice. Hey, um, Brenna, before, before we go zooming along, um, there was a question that Sam put in the chat um, asking, if you could talk uh, quickly about the 404 provision of the Clean Water Act and how it might be used to leverage better landscape evaluation and less CE. Just real quick, because that's a super oh. quick question. <laughs> that's a great question. Um, let's see, I actually have to, Bark, Bark doesn't engage much with the Clean Water Act. I like have to dig into the part of my life when I was the staff attorney for Willamette Riverkeeper, who dealt a lot with 404 permits. Um, but, but I'll say the, the main reason we don't is because, you know, the, if I remember right, the, the 404 permitting process is for mostly for point source pollution and not the, oh gosh, TMDLs, like the total maximum daily load of pollutants, which is what we look at more, because we're not dealing with point sources, right? The, there, there was a, a lawsuit that some of our um, comrades brought to try and designate Forest Service roads and their sediment as point sources of pollution to streams and try and get them to have the Clean Water Act permits apply. And uh, it went up to getting, I think it went up to the Supreme Court and they were like, no, a forest road is not a point source. And so we don't really engage with that. That's a little bit lower down on all of the water bodies that we work on. Um, but if you are interested and I'm not fully answering your question, please, if people have legally geeky questions that they want to ask me and we just don't have time, email me. It's brenna at bark-out.org. I love thinking and talking about this stuff. Um, I'm a little hard to call right now because we're all working from home. But if you email me, we can set up a phone date and like talk Clean Water Act until we're both like a little crazy.
but <laughs> unfortunately I'm running out of time. I spent a, a lot of, we might, we might go a little over um, because I still want to talk about fire and we're not quite there. Are there any other questions in the chat before I move on? Yeah, um, Sam asked if you could talk about conditional NEPA too. Sam, let's just talk. <laughs> I've got too much to cover, but that's a great question. Um, so yeah, shoot me an email and, and we'll discuss some more things. Okay, so pretty picture aside, you got it for a minute. We're going to just look, we're gonna do a real quick case study about NEPA and what it looks like when bark engages it. So, and this has a lot to do with the fires that are also happening. So one of the things that's true for the Forest Service right now is that they are framing almost all of their timber sales as fuels reduction or fire risk reduction timber sales. And mostly they're doing that because of politics and optics. Um, some, of, some of them actually are. As John was saying, there are some areas that used to have a lot more fire, like a lot more frequent fires, and they have grown in. And the Forest Service can go in and thin some of that underbrush and reintroduce fire through prescribed fires and restore the area. That is happening. However, most of what's happening is not that. This is a picture taken from an area that they said needed to be restored because it had, you know, was high fire risk. It's a moist mixed conifer old growth area on the eastern ridge of the Cascade Mountains. Um, and honestly, Bart called bullshit on this project. It was a 12,000 acre restoration project where over 6,000 acres were in moist mixed conifer forest and 3,000 acres were still in mature and old growth. Um, and the Forest Service said, uh, out of one side of its mouth, it said, we're doing this fuels reduction project to increase the forest resiliency to fire. On the other side of its mouth and behind closed doors, it said, we have an agreement with the regional office to pump through a timber sale to get 60 million board feet of timber to meet our timber targets, right? So they're trying to use that, you know, use the rhetoric to cover up what's really just a big timber grab. And the reason they needed that rhetoric is was because this timber sale was completely in critical habitat for the spotted owl, which you're only allowed to log if you're going to restore it to improve the owl's um, habitat and health. So bark doesn't litigate often, right? And, and I try and avoid it at all costs because it's a big pain in the butt. However, in, in this instance, barkers went out, we ground truth the heck out of the sale. It was 12,000 acres. It took a lot of people hours. We compiled the information, we gave it to the Forest Service. We said, a lot of this is old growth. A lot of this is in its natural fire regime. Just don't log that and, you know, and we'll be good. Like, do the dry forest stuff, do the stuff close to the communities where we can all agree that restoration needs to be but stay out of the mature, moist old growth. And they were like, no. We're like, really? They're like, yeah. We're like, okay, I guess we have to go to court. So we did. And we sued them because one of the things that NEPA does is it says that the, the agencies have to uh, take a hard look at all of the relevant factors and make a reasoned decision about the impacts of the project. And if those impacts might be significant, they have to do a much gr uh, an analysis of a much greater focus, an environmental impact statement. If they can say the, issue, the, the impacts will be insignificant, they just have to do an environmental assessment. So they went forward with this environmental assessment and were like, no, this is a huge project with a lot of old growth. Oh, thank you. <laughs> My daughter just brought me dinner, but I can't eat it quite now because I'm talking so much. Um, so, oh yeah, where was I? Environmental impact statements. So they're like, no, this doesn't have an impact. We're like, are you crazy? This is the largest timber sale Forest Service has ever done in Mount Hood National Forest, all in critical habitat, logging all this old growth. And it's highly controversial because a lot of the scientific research says logging increases fire risk. And we gave that information to the Forest Service and they ignored it. And we're like, really? They're like, yes. We're like, really? They're like, yes, we're just gonna ignore you. And NEPA was our way in. 
So I wanted to use this to illustrate how important it is that we have this law. And, it's, and I say that because the Trump administration just did a rulemaking that just guts NEPA and makes it almost impossible for people to engage with these projects and to do the kind of work that BARC does. We're hoping that those, um, that the new regulations get stopped in court and that we get a new administration before they really take off. But if we had those regulations now, it would be a much harder to get to the place where we got, where we won a lawsuit. We lost in the district court because the district court judge was like, yeah, you're right. They didn't look at your science. And, and yeah, you're right. The, the logging might make fires worse. That's all true. But in the context of a million acre Mount Hood National Forest, this 12,000 acres is not really big, so it's not significant. Um, but we went up to the Ninth Circuit and we said, hey, you know, this is highly controversial. And they just did not look at the science. And those judges read all the stuff and they said, you're right. They didn't. They didn't look at your science and they need to. And they also didn't look at the cumulative impacts of all of the other timber sales on the owls around there, and they need to. And so Bark just got this fantastic win in the Ninth Circuit, which is great because it means not only does Mount Hood National Forest need to take the science that says logging does not necessarily make fires better and it might make them worse, but across the West, all forest advocates now have that opinion and can use it to ensure that their forest, their national forests are looking at um, fire science and taking it seriously and engaging with it. So NEPA is the law that allows that kind of public participation to happen. So I am gonna go a little bit over, sorry, because um, I wanna just right now talk a little bit about fire policy. If you've got a bump, um, that's fine. Um, and again, like I said, if you want to follow up with me on any of this, please do. I am, I love to talk about it. And there's so much happening right now in terms of fire and climate policy to get engaged in. So as I was saying, the current fire management status quo is full suppression and backcountry logging. That's kind of where they're at. That's what they want to double down on. That's what a lot of federal legislation is doing. Um, you know, for the past about five years, the federal legislatures have been really excited about pushing forward bills that remove environmental laws for fuels, re fuels reduction projects, uh, which would allow things like that crystal clear project to go forward with no environmental review because whatever the Forest Service labels as fuels reduction is good. Um, happily, those laws haven't uh, necessarily passed. Some bits and pieces of them have moved into the Farm Bill, but thus far we've been able to stave those off. However, right now we are in a full-blown crisis of political opportunism with the fires up and down the West Coast. And we're already seeing senators vying to be the ones who can solve the problem, who can fix the fire solution uh, or fi fix the fire crisis with their solution. And still their favorite solution is more money into backcountry logging. And, you know, there's all the science, but there's also common sense. And when fire is a weather event, like it was last week, no amount of logging is going to stop that fire. And in some places where they have done fuel reduction, we were interested to see what happened to the forest. Did it burn less severely? It might have. Um, there's areas of crystal clear that got logged before we stopped them by the lawsuit that just burned in the White River fire. I know that all of their slash was untreated so there were huge slash piles left after their fuels reduction. I'm really curious to see that if the fire got in there, did it actually blow up because of that? Or um, it's not necessarily my bias, but maybe it did burn better. You know, maybe there is information for us out there. But I think the main thing that we're all realizing is no matter what kind of backcountry solution they have, it does not address 
the real crisis, which is located in communities. And what so many of us in the uh, fire and climate and forest communities are advocating for is shifting our focus away from uh, backcountry logging and fire suppression to talking about building more community resiliency and supporting public health. Because where the policy decisions need to go are how to do we protect homes and communities? And how do we ensure that people are safe and healthy when smoke conditions happen? Because we cannot prevent fires. If there's anything we've learned over the past 20 years, uh, as the climate warms, as we get out of that cool period that we had from about 1940 to 1980, and the climate is steadily warming, is that fires are a fact of weather. Things are drying, things are warming, the fire season is longer, and prevention is no longer an option. Suppression is not working. And billions of dollars are being thrown into it. <laughs> you know, the White River Fire on the east side of Mount Hood was a lightning fire in an area that needs to burn. Everyone agrees has missed fire intervals. The Forest Service has spent about $15 million putting it out. And I would posit that that $15 million would be really great to help people in Mill City and Gates and Detroit rebuild in ways that were more fire resilient. Like what if we redirected our federal funding away from full suppression, especially of fires that are naturally lit and need to burn and towards building community resiliency. And that's something that I would, I kind of want to leave you with is that sense is when you're moving forward in conversations about fire, because I'm sure you're having them, that the solutions need to be around how do we keep people's communities safer and more resilient and how do we deal with the very real public crisis of smoke which is not about ensuring that there's less smoke in the air but preparing for it like people prepare for hurricanes two days ago one of my best friends who lives in new orleans called me she's like how are your fires i was like how are your hurricanes and we discussed the difference in how people prepare and in new orleans they know they can't put out their hurricanes right People aren't out there with leaf blowers trying to like redirect the wind or dry out the hurricane. They prepare for them. And that's what we need to do in fire policy. We need to stop thinking like, how do we get out our hose and put out this weather event? And start thinking, how do we make our communities more adaptable? And there will be state legislation and there will be federal legislation where this is a contested issue. And that is what I think it's really important to leave with, is this is a moment where we can turn things around and we can move from that 120 years of bad fire policy and talk about what does it look to get it on the ground in a good way, in a way that promotes community security and public health, rather than treating it like something that can be controlled and should be put out. So that's what I got. Um, it's been a hard year. <laughs> so I also want to send you all with a lot of love. One amazing thing about being part of the BART community is that we are a community. And even if we can't see each other in person, we can share in this experience together. We can share in our love of the forest, our love of the land, a love of our, um, our home in Oregon, even if it's complicated, even if we are holding that hard legacy of settler col colonization and trying to figure out our own place in it, we can still love the land and treat it like it's our home because it is. And it needs us to advocate for it because for so long, people have just focused on what the land can give them, what they can take from it. And we need to be part of unsettling that and creating a culture where we're a lot more in tune with how we live with the land how we can listen to it and give it what it needs. So thank you so much for being here as I've talked at you quite a bit. Um, and you know, I hope that some of this information can be useful as you move forward in doing your own advocacy and also as you engage with BARC in our future advocacy when we're able to get out into the forest more together and come together at campouts and 
um, rallies and a lot of political advocacy that I know is to come. So I can stay on a little bit longer and answer more questions. I see the little chat is lighting up. If you've got to go, please go. I really appreciate you being here. Anything, anything else that we want to talk about? Um, Brenna, Cody put a question in the chat way back there. Um, what, yeah, another one of these like real quick and easy um, questions. Could you briefly speak to what and who are some of the historically most influential non-governmental groups in Oregon lobbying for fire suppression as the reason to be for timber, i.e. what are the non-governmental old boys clubs of logging in Oregon? What does this look like today? Yes, okay, uh, there is a short answer to that. It's, the, um, it's called the American Forest Resource Council, the AFRC. They are the lobby and advocacy wing of the timber industry on the West Coast. They are headquartered in Portland. They are one of Bark's nemeses. They are super active in uh, lobbying for full suppression. They're also one of those voices that's really into, if we just logged it all, it wouldn't burn. Um, so AFRC, super bad. Another group, well, you asked for non-governmental, but I'll give you a kind of more obscure governmental one. It's the Association of Oregon Counties. Because counties get their money, a lot of their money from logging on federal lands. And so the Association of Oregon Counties has been very pro-timber and anti-ecological management. Um, those are two. But the timber industry has really, really been, the whole time for the past hundred and some years, the major proponent of stopping all the fires to save the value of the timber. Hey, y'all rock. Have a great night, rest of the night. Um, if you want to come back next week for uh, two hours of Northwest Forestland history with me and my comrade Courtney Ray. Um, that'll be fun. And then in October, Courtney and I also are going to do a real deep dive on climate change in Mount Hood National Forest and what we're facing um, in the future. We're talking about the science and the policy parts of climate change on Mount Hood. The recording will be on Vimeo. Um, I'll send out an email with a link to that. Yep. Um, it's vimeo.com uh, backslash, I have it somewhere, but I posted it in the chat and I'll post it again. Um, thank you all for coming.